Well, good morning. Uh, this morning, as part of our service, to prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, uh, if you can begin turning in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, please raise your hand and some men that will be coming up the sides. We'll make sure to give you one so that you can follow along with us during the service as we read God's Word today. And as you turn there to 1 Peter 5, it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, left instructions about particular practices that followers of Christ ought to participate in when we gather together. And we often call these practices ordinances, and they are both visual reminders of spiritual realities that were accomplished at the cross and, and that the participant proclaims through their participation. And they pro proclaim union with Christ and participation as we partake of these ordinances. And the first of those particular practices is baptism. And whenever a person repents of their sin and they turn to follow Christ, trusting in him alone for salvation and his sacrifice on the cross for sin, as the sinless substitute who bore our sin on his body. We remember that, we picture that in baptism. Uh, those who put their hope in Jesus Christ in, for salvation in that way, they are spiritually united to Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. And when a new follower of Christ has been united by faith to Christ in this way, they are baptized and they're immersed in water and they go under the water and they're brought out of the water. And as they go down, they, they're, they're proclaiming their union with Christ and his death for our sin. And when they come up, they're proclaiming their union with Christ and his resurrection and the fact that they now stand in newness of life, not because of what they've done, but because of what Christ did. And they publicly proclaim their faith in Christ, and they publicly associate with the body of Christ, the church. Well, the second ordinance Jesus gave to the church is the Lord's Supper or communion. And just like baptism, uh, this is a symbol. We, we take a piece of bread and we eat it. We remember Christ's death. We take it and drink from a cup. We remember his shed blood. Why do we do this? It's a symbol the cup and the bread don't somehow mystically become Christ's blood and body. No, they help us remember what was already accomplished. So when we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we do it as a remembrance and as a proclamation. And we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ under the weight of our sin. And we proclaim to one another the Lord's death until he comes again. So it's forward-looking. Our, 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 our Messiah, our Savior, did not remain in the grave. So whereas baptism is a one-time proclamation of union with Christ, communion is an ongoing, repeated remembrance and proclamation of those who are already part of the body of Christ as we proclaim to each other the Lord's death. So as we prepare for communion, and if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we ask that when the trays with the cups and the bread are passed around in a few minutes, that you would let them pass in front of you and, and, and that you would actually sit there and listen. And, our, and as you do so, our prayer is that you would know what it means to come to know Christ in this way today. So if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to 1 Peter 5. And while you're turning, in, in verses 1 through 4, Peter is exhorting the elders of the church to exercise humble leadership. And then in verse 5, he exhorts young men to humble, humbly place themselves under the leadership that is over them. And then in the middle of verse 5, Peter, knowing that these two particular groups needed a special encouragement to pursue Christ-like humility, he then turns to the rest of the church. In middle verse 5, Peter expands his instruction on the necessity of humility in the Christian life to every believer. So let's look at verse 5 together. Starting in that second clause, and all of you, 
clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter calls believers to put on humility, to clothe themselves with it, to put it on like a garment towards one another. And this is critical instruction for the church. As we celebrate the Lord's table this morning with our fellow believers, we are reminded as we take it together that we are one body. We're connected with one another. When one rejoices, we rejoice. When one suffers, we all suffer. What would be devastating to that unity when we come together is if each believer sought after their own interests. If each participated in the church for their own gain, for their own benefit, for their own exaltation. Instead, believers are to exercise humility towards one another, a a loneliness of mind, an absolute refusal to exalt oneself. This lowliness of mind is to be our garment. We're to put it on. I'm going to ask the men in the back to come forward and pass out the communion elements at this time. And as they do so, hold on to them. And I just want to make two observations about this passage we just read together. What truths should fuel believers as we step into the church and refuse to exalt ourselves and our preferences What truth ought to fuel us to walk in garments of lowliness and of mind and humility towards one another? Number one, know that God is opposed to self-exaltation and confess it. God hates this sort of self-exaltation. When we come together with fellow believers, do you seek to assert your own preferences and will? What about in your family? In the church, are you patient with those whose preferences and opinions differ than your own? How do you respond when the actions of others infringe upon your own preferences that make things inconvenient for you, your own ideas, your self-perceived rights? Do you find yourself perhaps maybe always vying for the attention of those in positions of power or influence? Do you have to be in the know? Do you assist upon always sharing your own opinions? Or do you seek to draw out one another? So this morning, as you consider how you interact with the body, examine yourself. Where do you see pride and self-exaltation? And know that God is opposed to it and confess it. But number two, to the one who is humble who empties himself of asserting their own will and their preferences over others, who ceases seek, trying to climb over their brothers, seeking to put others beneath him, the one who refuses that sort of self-exaltation, what do we see that God gives grace? So number two, know that God desires to give grace to the humble. Verse five, but God gives grace to the humble. Clothing yourself with the humility that refuses to exalt self is a high calling. And we can't do it in our own strength. But if we've been united with Christ, he's actually given us sufficient grace to conduct ourselves in this way. Grace that, it's grace that actually enables a sort of humility. And in this verse, we actually see not only does grace enable this sort of humility, but it's actually a, this sort of humility is actually a channel of further grace from the Lord. Believer, hold on to the bread and the juice that's in your hands and and just consider and confess areas of pride and self-exaltation in your own life. Plead with the Lord that you would walk humble Walk with humility in the church and consider Christ who demonstrated this very humility when he emptied himself of his own self-interest, refused to exalt himself, but instead humbly trusted himself to his father and endured far more than the trampling of his preferences by others. 
but endured the anger and the hostility of God that was designed against our own sin. But Jesus took it upon himself. Well, if you would take the cup in your hand, and we'll read from Matthew 26. Now, while they're eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it. And giving it to the disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body. So let's take, and let's eat this bread together. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. <clears throat> 